I'm going to go ahead and call this first meeting to order. Welcome to our first meeting of the Legislative Committee for the Review and Oversight of the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency and Marlette Lake Water System. Quite the mouthful. Um, our committee policy analyst will be calling roll today, Ms. Keller. Senator Brooks. Here. Senator Scheibel. Here. Senator Settlemeyer. Here. Assemblywoman Cohen. Here. Assemblywoman Krasner. Here. And Assemblywoman Peters. Here. It appears we are all here today. That's great. We have a call. Um, as the vice chair of the last interim, um, I will be presiding over the meeting until we have a new chair and vice chair. First, I would like to go over some housekeeping and reminders. Please mute your microphone when you're not speaking. Meeting materials can be accessed on the committee's webpage of the legislative website. Anyone who would like to receive electronic notification uh, and access to the committee's agenda, minutes and final reports can do so by signing on, up on the Nevada legislature's website. Votes taken today, including elections of the chair and vice chair, will use a roll call vote to do so. There will be a public comment period at the beginning and the end of the meeting with public comment limited to three minutes per speaker. Any additional comments will be asked to be submitted in writing for our review. Public comment may be provided in four different ways, all of which are listed on the agenda, but include by phone, dialing 669-900-6833 and then entering the meeting ID shown on the agenda. You may also email public comment at to tahoe at lcd.state.nv.us. Public comment can also be mailed in um, to research division, 401 South Carson Street, Carson City, Nevada, 89701. And we also conveniently have a fax number that is 775-684-6400 and we can receive public comment that way as well. Finally, so that all of our discussions can be part of the public record, I would like to remind committee members and presenters that the chat feature is only to be used for technical assistance with DPS. It is not to be used for any communication between members or by presenters unless requesting technical assistance from DPS. With that, I would like to move on to public comment. Public comment will be limited to three minutes per speaker to ensure everyone is given a fair opportunity to speak. You'll be notified when your time is up at the three minute mark. Any additional information may be provided in writing to be added to the record. An additional opportunity to make public comment will be available at the end of the meeting. Our broadcast and production services staff will interact with those making public comment to facilitate participation in the meeting. Broadcast and production services, please add the first caller with the public comment with public comment to the meeting. Thank you, Chair. If you wish to provide public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Once again, if you wish to provide public comment, you may press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, the line is open and working, but at this time we have no callers wishing to provide public comment. Thank you so much. Seeing no public comment, we will now move on to the next agenda item. Um, agenda item three is the election of chair and vice chair. And this would be for the 2021-2022 interim. Uh, chair and vice chair will be selected by members of the committee. Um, and the chair is to be elected from one house of the legislature and the vice chair of the other house last interim. The Senate was chair of the committee and I was vice chair for the assembly. I would accept a nomination for chair of the committee. Hi, this is Melanie Scheibel for the record and I would like to nominate assembly member Peters as our chair. Thank you so much. I have a nomination for myself as, uh, to serve as chair for this interim. Do we have a second? This is Leslie Cohen, I second. Thank you. 
Do we have, uh, so I have a motion and uh, a second to elect myself, Sarah Peters, to serve as chair. Is there any discussion on the nomination? Seeing none, will our policy analyst, Ms. Keller, please call a roll call vote regarding the nomination of Sarah Peters, myself, as chair. Committee, please indicate yes or no on the nomination. Senator Brooks. Yes. Senator Scheibel. Yes. Senator Settlemeyer. Yes. Assemblywoman Cohen. Yes. Assemblywoman Krasner. Yes. And Assemblywoman Peters. Yes, thank you so much. It's an honor to serve as chair of this committee. Um, next, we will move on to nomination of vice chair of the committee. This person must be from the other house. Do I have a nomination? I move that we nominate uh, Senator Scheibel for vice chair of the committee. Thank you. I have a motion for vice chair of the committee. Do I have a second? I second. Thank you. I have a second on um, that motion from Assemblywoman Cohen. Is there a nomination of Senator Scheibel as vice chair? Seeing none, for our policy analyst, please call a roll call vote regarding the nomination of Senator Scheibel. Senator Brooks. Yes. Senator Scheibel. Yes. Senator Settlemeyer. Yes. Assemblywoman Cohen. Yes. Assemblywoman Krasner. Assemblywoman Krasner? Yes. And Assemblywoman Peters? Yes. Great. Senator Scheibel is elected vice chair. Now that is out of the way, we can move on to agenda item four, um, opening remarks and introductions by myself and the rest of our committee. I just want to thank you all. It's an honor to be serving as chair of this interim. Last interim was interesting. Um, we had a couple of initial in-person meetings and then moved to a virtual format. We heard from regional stakeholders on a variety of issues that we will be discussing some of the bills that came from this committee based on these discussions. However, like much of the last two years, things were sidelined because of various unknowns that the COVID-19 pandemic brought with. I'm sure we will be taking talking about increased need to address certain niche issues such as the traffic, climate change, wildfire impact on the basin. We'll also be talking about the impact uh, or the, uh, the input. Um, I'm sorry. We will also be taking input from regional um, efforts around these issues as well as looking at impacts to local and regional communities. So we are charged with the policy oversight of the public utility. We we'll also be talking about communities outside, pretty distant from the Tahoe Basin and the needs of the Marlette Lake water system. Always an interesting topic in my opinion. After this initial meeting, our meeting will, our next meeting will be in May, and then we will be holding one meeting per month until our final meeting in August. My hope is that by May, we will be able to hold our remaining meetings in person at various locations within the Tahoe Basin and we'll have related informational tours as this has been the tradition of this committee. Topics the committee will cover uh, in the remaining e meetings include transportation, sustainable recreation, economic development, including re regional housing and Airbnb issues, forest health and wildfire, including emergency management, and Lake Tahoe health, climate resiliency, water quality clarity, and aquatic invasive species among those. Our final meeting will include our work session regarding recommendations. Members, uh, please do not hesitate to contact myself or our policy analyst, Elisa Keller, regarding other topics you would like the, com the committee to consider. There are a variety of areas of interest in the Tahoe Basin, and we um, would like to hear from you about what you think are important issues. During the interim, the committee will be receiving ideas for recommendations for action and legislation. I encourage presenters to bring ideas to the committee's attention early in the interim so that we may, be, uh, we may best utilize our time as a committee to ask important policy questions related to those. 
Also, after this meeting, a solicitation of recommendations will be posted to the committee's webpage. I encourage members of the public to please submit their recommendations for committee action and legislation as well. Next, I would like to introduce the members of our committee and staff. Um, I would be remiss if I did not say that I represent Assembly District 24, which is in the heart of Reno. I've lived in Nevada my whole life, um, and the Tahoe Basin is really important to me. Um, I would like other uh, to go through the committee members and have them introduce themselves and indicate their interest in serving on this committee. I'm going to go ahead and start with Vice Chair Scheibel. Thank you so much, Chair Peters, and thank you to all of our staff and presenters and members who have made the time to be available today and join us for our inaugural committee meeting. Um, I, my name is Melanie Scheibel. I represent Senate District 9, which is in the southern part of the state. Um, and includes parts of Las Vegas, as well as um, Spring Valley and uh, almost touches Red Rock Canyon. But I originally hail from the north um, in the Reno area and I'm really excited about learning more about the Lake Tahoe region and uh, what we can do to protect it. Thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and ask Senator Brooks to introduce himself. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, I, I'm Senator Chris Brooks from Senate District 3, which is 500 miles away from the Tahoe Basin, but um, I, as, some, as someone who's born and raised in the state and has served on natural resources for three sessions and finance for two, I'm very familiar with the importance of uh, Tahoe to our entire economy and to everyone who lives in this state. And I look forward to doing what I can to help protect it. Thank you. Senator Settlemeyer, would you like to introduce yourself next? Nothing for me. I'm okay. Thank you, Senator. Assemblywoman Cohen, would you like to introduce yourself next? Thank you, Chair. I'm Leslie Cohen representing Assembly District 29, uh, which is even farther away uh, from the basin than Senator Brooks district in uh, the older part of Henderson, a little bit of Silverado Ranch, and then also the older part of Green Valley. Uh, but I'm very excited to serve on this committee and see how we can uh, best protect the basin and also uh, make the help the basin remain a, a wonderful place to live and visit. Thank you, Assemblywoman. And last but not least, Assemblywoman Krasner, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Chair Scheibel. I'm Assemblywoman Lisa Krasner. I am the sitting Assemblywoman for Nevada State Assembly District 26. And part of Lake Tahoe is in Assembly District 26 because I represent Incline Village and Crystal Bay. Um, I love Lake Tahoe and have brought my children there since they were little. Uh, it's truly the jewel of Nevada, and I want to do everything I can to preserve and protect Lake Tahoe. So very happy to be on this committee. I'd also like to take a moment to introduce our staff, our interim staff, uh, Elisa Keller. She will be serving as our committee, committee policy analyst. She will be helping us with background and research on the issues that come before the committee. Eileen O'Grady and Aaron Strudevant are serving as our legal counsel. They are unable to attend today. So for today's meeting, our legal counsel will be Heidi uh, Clarson. Our fiscal analyst, Justin Luna, will assist us with a, any fiscal matters. And our committee secretary, Lisa Gardner, will be preparing our meeting minutes and will assist us all with a variety of other tasks as they arise. With that, we will move on to agenda item five, overview of committee's statutory duties and a summary of recommendations from the 2019-2020 interim. Under this agenda item, I will ask our committee policy analyst, Lisa Keller, to provide, I'm, I apologize, thank you. Uh, she'll provide an overview of the committee's duties and responsibilities. Ms. Keller, would you please go ahead and proceed? Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon. My name is Alisa Keller, and I am with the Research Division of the Legislative Council Bureau, and I am pleased to be serving as your Committee Policy Analyst this interim. So I have prepared a uh, short four-page committee overview document 
and that is available in the members meeting packet and is also available on the committee's webpage on the legislature's website. So I will briefly touch on some of the high points in that document. Um, the first page of the document sets forth some of the history of the committee and the uh, membership details. And um, the general duties of the committee are also set forth. And that includes providing appropriate review and oversight of the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency and the Marlette Lake Water System, reviewing the budget, programs, activities, responsiveness, and accountability of both entities in such a manner as deemed necessary and appropriate by the committee, studying the role, authority, and activities of the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency regarding the Tahoe the Lake Tahoe Basin and the Marlette Lake Water System regarding Marlette Lake and continuing to communicate with members of the legislature of the state of California to achieve the goals set forth in the Tahoe Regional Planning Compact. The next page includes a description of voting requirements and bill draft requests and the committee is authorized to submit no more than 10 bill draft requests or BDRs to the legal division of the Legislative Council Bureau for drafting. And those 10 legislative measures must relate to matters within the scope of the committee and be submitted by September 1st, 2022. Regarding voting, a simple majority is required to approve most committee actions. However, committee bill draft requests must be approved by a majority of the members of each house appointed to the committee. Following the final meeting of each interim, a written report will be prepared, summarizing the activities of the committee, including any bill drafts requested for the next legislative session. And the report from last interim is available on the Nevada legislature's website. I've also included descriptions and links to some other reports available on the Nevada Legislature's website that may be of particular interest to the committee. Um, those include the annual audit report of the TRPA, the 2021 annual report on fire prevention and forest health in the Nevada portion of the Lake Tahoe Basin, and the status report on the Legislature's interim, to the Legislature's Interim Finance Committee fund to protect the Lake Tahoe Basin. So please let me know if you have any trouble accessing these reports or any other reports that you're interested in for review. And then on the third page, you will find a summary of committee recommendations for legislation from the 2019-20 interim. And last interim, the committee recommended three resolutions and one bill, all of which were adopted by the 2021 legislature. The first recommendation resulted in Senate Concurrent Resolution 9, expressing the Nevada legislature's support for the Nevada system of higher education to work collaboratively among its institutions to coordinate all research focused on addressing the specific needs of the Lake Tahoe Basin and recommending and she enhanced coordination and collaborative efforts with DCNR and other state and federal agencies. The second resulted in Senate Joint Resolution 12, expressing the priority of the timely completion of the Tahoe East Shore Trail Extension Project along the State Route 28 National Scenic Byway and urging Congress to provide federal funding for completion the third resulted in Senate Concurrent Resolution 8, expressing the Nevada Legislature's support for identifying key transportation priorities for the Lake Tahoe Basin to improve resident and visitor safety while protecting and enhancing the ecosystem. The fourth recommendation resulted in Senate Bill 368, authorizing the release of the next phase of bonds in an amount of $4 million to continue to implement Nevada's portion of the Lake Tahoe Environmental Improvement Program for the 2021-23 biennium. So the committee last interim also recommended the drafting of several letters, including 
some in support of various grant applications for improvements of the Marlette Lake water system. So finally, this document includes a list of staff contacts. So I would just um, like to ask you to please do not hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or if you'd like any research performed regarding the matters that will come before the committee. And I look forward to working with you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Keller. And I just want to express my gratitude for Ms. Keller and this committee. She's been around for a little bit, probably longer than all of us, um, serving on the committee. And she is just a wealth of knowledge and information and really a joy to work with. So if you have questions that come up about what this committee has previously done or current issues in the basin, please do not hesitate to reach out. She's amazing. We're going to go ahead and move on to agenda item six. This is um, I'm on six, right? Okay, yes. Uh, agenda item six, overview of the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency. We're going to move on to, this is our first presentation of the day. We have a full agenda, so I'd like to remind our presenters to please do your best to stay within the requested 20-minute time frame. Um, well, the presenters for our first agenda item, please proceed when ready. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chair Peters. Good afternoon, members of the committee. I'm Joanne Marquetta, I'm TRPA's Executive Director for the record. My goal today is to offer context for presentations that will follow. Uh, we're, it'll be both an overview of the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency, as well as updates of key issues uh, facing the bi-state region. This is a refresher for some of you, for new members. It offers us a common base of understanding uh, Tahoe as a starting point. Joining me today is TRPA's Deputy Director and Chief of External Affairs, Julie Reagan. Next slide. Tahoe's context has always been complex, but our challenges that we're facing today are unprecedented. Climate change is causing wildfire danger unlike any we've experienced. And the Calder fire from last September is emblazoned in our mind's eye. The lake temperatures are warming. They're opening new threats from invasive species. And the pandemic driven outdoor recreation demand is off the charts. So the need right now for bi-state collaboration is more important than it's ever been. Being at the intersection of so many jurisdictions, Tahoe started from a fractured history. In the mid 1960s, the states realized that overdevelopment was threatening the lake and its pristine environment. And the states saw the need to come together to save the lake. In 1969, a bi-state compact agreement was signed by the states, ratified by Congress and signed by President Nixon that formed the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency. This unique interstate compact is, is literally one of its one of a kind in the United States. And it created a unique jurisdiction that's defined by Lake Tahoe's watershed. And that governance agreement created TRPA as a bi-state regional authority to protect Lake Tahoe by harmonizing our natural and human-made environment. TRPA, during our first three decades, successfully halted through growth control measures the unchecked development that was threatening the lake. The compact is unique because our responsibility range is broad and encompassing. We have planning, regulatory, and environmental protection authority over the region, and we're also the federal and state designated transportation planning authority that's authorized to receive federal and state transportation funds to implement our adopted regional transportation plan. So we're not a single purpose agency. The regional plan and the regional transportation plans we create address land use, transportation, recreation, conservation, all that are needed to achieve and maintain our regional environmental standards at, at, while at the same time providing orderly growth and development. The compact has evolved with the times. Amendments in 1980 changed the governing board's voting structure and directed creation of environmental goals called thresholds for the region. And I'll, I'll touch on those in a moment. Further amendments in 2013 authorized TRPA to incorporate economic considerations in our decision-making 
and Congress ratified that change in 2016. Next slide. That watershed boundary that is the Tahoe region spans state lines. Two thirds is in California, one third of the lake and land base is in Nevada. And there are portions of five local government jurisdictions within the region bounds. So parts of Douglas and Washoe in Nevada, Washoe County is in Nevada, and the rural portion of Carson City touch the lake, parts of Placer and El Dorado counties in California, as well as the city of South Lake Tahoe, all fall within Tahoe's jurisdiction. So the two states, as well as each local government that touches Lake Tahoe, have representatives on TRPA's 15-member governing board, seven from Nevada and seven from California, and then there's one non-voting federal presidential appointee. The vast majority of Tahoe's land base, 80%, is under federal ownership and management by the U.S. Forest Service, and only about 10% of the basin's land is in private ownership, and that's largely the developed areas in our small town centers, like State Line, the Casino Corps, Incline Village, South Lake Tahoe, Kings Beach, Tahoe City on the California side. TRPA makes all of our decisions in consultation with a 21 member advisory planning commission that includes the Washoe tribe, as well as uh, the two states water resource agencies, as well as fire district representatives. So everything that we do is in coordination and partnership with multiple jurisdictions and agencies and landowners. And you, some of you have heard me say often, the secret sauce of Tahoe is epic collaboration across jurisdiction boundaries and across all sectors. And fortunately, our 50 year old partnership positions us to cooperate well and tackle some of these unprecedented challenges. That culture of collaboration, though, has taken 50 years to build. Next slide. The scope and scale of TRPA's mission is broad. In, in, in its broad outline, we set goals that are called thresholds. We adopt plans to achieve those goals. We coordinate and deliver programs and projects to implement those goals. And then we're accountable to outcome by monitoring, measuring, and reporting on progress made. The first adopted regional environmental standards called thresholds were adopted in 1980, and the required categories are what you see here on the slide. We comprehensively updated our Tahoe Regional Plan in 2012 with the changes needed to achieve our threshold standards, and that new regional plan was unanimously adopted and widely supported. In the last threshold evaluation in 2020, where we report progress comprehensively every four years, we found that 80% of our threshold standards that we can measure are in attainment and the trends are positive in most of these categories. Next slide. The Lake Tahoe region is 500 square miles of, the, of steep high alpine forest it rings one of the deepest and clearest large alpine lakes in the world. Most of our resource de degradation happened early in the 1950s through the 1970s prior to having a comprehensive regional plan. And it was in those early decades that private development was degrading uh, our natural environment. 75% of our marshes, 50% of our meadows, and those lost wetlands are the natural systems that filter nutrients and pollutants before they get to the lake. Next slide. So after the early growth control measures that we adopted had successfully slowed the harms from development, we saw that regulation alone was not enough to restore past damage. We needed a different approach. We needed programs to correct the problems of the past to restore the watershed and to repair those legacy harms to the system. So it was in the late 1990s where TRPA launched what we call the Lake Tahoe Environmental Improvement Program. We often shorten that to the EIP. It's our coordinated partnership strategy to attain thresholds and meet the requirements of our regional plan. Uh, Kim Carringer, who heads TRPA's EIP division, is going to present later today with our Nevada colleagues on this 
exceptionally important program. I will say this about it, over 25 years of shared progress, the EIP's reputation for effectiveness rivals the importance of other large national restoration initiatives like the Chesapeake, the Everglades, Great Lakes and maybe others. So the work we do for Tahoe is not just on a regional, but on a national and international stage with the very strong support of our federal congressional delegation. Next slide. Implementing the EIP is, is a top strategic priority of TRPA. And I'm gonna to touch on three important strategic focus areas, water quality, aquatic invasive species, and health and uh, forest health and fire management. With the lake as our organizing center, water quality is of course one of our highest priorities of the EIP. And it, the signature measure of lake health is our famously clear waters. So for decades from the 60s through the 90s, the lake had been losing clarity at a rate of a foot a year. It was fine sediment particles that we learned about from our roads and our urban areas that were causing the largest cause of, of uh, clarity decline. And it was after a decade of study in 2011 where we launched what's called the Lake Tahoe Total Maximum Daily Load or TMDL program. It's a science-based plan that set targets to reduce fine sediment, phosphorus and nitrogen pollution that comes from stormwater to restore the lake's famous clarity. That program sets interim goals that we call the clarity challenge to restore clarity to roughly a hundred feet. And according to the most recent performance reports, implementing partners are meeting the targets for pollution reduction and declines in Lake Tahoe's uh, famed water clarity have now stabilized. The improvements we're seeing are driven by those EIP investments to reduce stormwater pollution. But now due to the shifting uh, patterns that we're seeing from climate, we're also seeing impacts from warming lake temperatures. So while winter clarity is improving, our average summer clarity is actually getting worse. The Tahoe Science Advisory Council, which Jim Lawrence will speak to a little later today, is helping us assess what might be done. Next slide. Uh, prevention and control of aquatic invasive species is another top priority for TRPA and the partnership. It was a little over a decade ago that we saw signs of a new peril. It was this, the spread of aquatic invasive species across the waterways of the Western states. And we saw that as a, as a new threat to Lake Tahoe's environment, its recreational experiences, and the $5 billion economy. In response, TRPA organized nearly 40 partners, and that Tahoe partnership has become a national leader in invasive species prevention and control since then. Federal agencies recognized our bi-state management plan as a model for the nation, and we now have a mandatory boat inspection program that oversees that has overseen the inspection of more than 100,000 watercraft since 2008. That boat inspection program is working. There have been no new aquatic invasive species introductions since then. And truthfully, we have to remain vigilant. Last summer, 28 boats containing invasive mussels were stopped by Tahoe boat inspectors before they could launch into our lake. And that's a 40% increase over the prior year. So drought and rising temperature are bringing more and more boaters to Lake Tahoe as more look to escape some of this record heat and some of the low reservoirs. The importance of this prevention program cannot be overemphasized. We are so grateful for the funding commitments that have been made by Nevada and California that combine with federal funding and our inspection fees paid by voters that sustainably uh, fund this very important program. Next slide. Invasive species prevention is coupled with a very robust control program against invaders that are already in the lake. This slide shows the impact that invasive species can have and an example here of, a, of our control program, TRPA is managing the largest aquatic weed control project to date in uh, this Taylor Creek March, marsh. 
It's a 17 acre project and it's a necessary prerequisite to the US Forest Service's EIP project to restore one of the last functioning wetlands remaining in the Tahoe Basin. So here again, EPIC collaboration is at work. You'll be hearing later today from Amy Berry, who's the CEO of the Tahoe Fund. Their private philanthropic donations actually contributed to this and other critical projects for Tahoe. So we have a science-based roadmap that was created by the University of Nevada at Reno that guides our priorities in the fight against AIS. And it's called the Implementation Plan for Control of AIS in Lake Tahoe. It identifies our best chances to control and eradicate and the locations where projects will be most effective. This plan identifies the need for more than $7 million a year to manage existing invasive species. And I'm happy to say we have successfully secured the lion's share of this funding through uh, the partnership, federal, state, private sector support. And most recently that includes uh, $17 million in the recently passed bipartisan infrastructure law. Next. Let's shift gears. TRPA's top priorities on the water side combine with one of the EIP's top concerns on the landscape, and that's the health and preservation of our forests and the safety of our communities. Catastrophic fires burned on every side of Tahoe last summer. And one of them, the Calder fire, tested our resilience in a big way. It inflicted loss and destruction across more than 221,000 acres of forest at an astonishing rate, and it eventually entered the Tahoe Basin, burned 10,000 acres on our south shore, and our neighbors just out of the basin to the west lost 1,000 homes and businesses, and remarkably, Lake Tahoe's communities were spared. More than 30,000 residents safely evacuated from the south shore last summer, and not a single home or life, blessedly, was lost. So Firefighters and a change in wind direction helped, but years of successful fuels reduction work in our wildland urban interface and the fire defensible space work of our local communities were crucial factors in why Tahoe as we know it still stands today. The unwavering commitment made by more than 21 Tahoe fire and fuels team partners to hazardous fuels reduction and community wildfire protection have helped save our communities and stem the construction there. Uh, since the devastating Angora wildfire in the basin in 2007, where we, we lost nearly 250 Lake Tahoe homes, our Tahoe fire and fuels team partners have reduced fuels on more than 67,000 acre, uh, 67, acres in the basin. Given the unprecedented threats though to Tahoe's forests, we're working to increase that pace and scale of hazardous fuels reduction going forward. So our governing board will be voting next week on a policy that will allow mechanized equipment on steep slopes up to 50% to accelerate those forest treatments. And we're grateful for the state of Nevada's support for this crucial policy change. Our governing board sets and regularly updates TRPA's key strategic initiatives and our work program priorities. You see them listed here. They guide our work over the next uh, roughly five years. Among those not mentioned yet is a three-legged stool of interrelated issues, transportation, recreation, and housing. Uh, let me start first on transportation, which we call Keep Tahoe Moving. This is transportation and its relationship to visitation travel. Roughly 20 years ago, TRPA was, became the federally designated Metropolitan Planning Organization or MPO. As Tahoe's MPO, TRPA has this very unique opportunity to link land use planning to the region's transportation system. Uh, and we adopt every four years an updated regional transportation plan that transportation plan authorizes the region to receive federal and state transportation funding for the projects and programs that we approve in that regional transportation plan. So Tahoe's $5 billion economy is built largely on a foundation of tourism. 
So that in transportation, our emphasis is on how we move growing numbers of visitors. The region's disconnected transportation network gives people very few options to driving and really underserves the need of residents and visitors. We have data now showing that 10 million cars enter the basin annually. That's more than previous estimates. So how we manage people and their movements to and from and around Tahoe are important to the quality of the recreation experience, the health of the economy, and the protection of the lake. TRPA adopted a new regional transportation plan last year. It calls for new investments in transit, in trails, in updated technology. It specified developing detailed quarter plans like the one you're seeing unfold on State Route 28 along Nevada's East Shore. That updated RTP clearly identifies a long-term transportation funding shortfall that needs to be filled by new unspecified revenues to deliver on the plan's strategies for solving these recreation and commuter travel needs. So TRPA is participating with many others in a bi-state consultation on transportation that has been convened by the two states. Jim Lawrence will touch on this important partnership work we're trying to drive alignment among the myriad interest in our complicated transportation program area at the lake. Let me next go to recreation. We couple our transportation work with a new initiative to align outdoor recreation and tourism goals. And this is specifically to improve our recreation destination management. For the last two years, uh, when the only safe option to COVID isolation was, was the call to get into the great outdoors, the experience that we know as our backyard became the backyard of 15 million people who live within a day's drive of Tahoe. And like many other favorite outdoor recreation destinations across the West today, that increasing popularity and use of Lake Tahoe is now negatively impacting some of our natural resources, our travel at peak times, and the quality of the recreation experience. TRP help, TRPA helped form a sustainable recreation and tourism coalition with the US Forest Service that's bringing the public and private sectors together for the first time. And now our public land managers and visitors authorities are beginning to coordinate goals and actions to better manage our recreation, visitation, and stewardship. On field tours with you this summer, where hopefully we'll be face-to-face, -face, we'll show you some of this collaborative work firsthand. We also have a housing initiative that we call Tahoe Living, because Tahoe cannot sustain its businesses, tourism, or otherwise, if we can't attract and affordably house our workers. So housing workers closer to their employment reduces traffic congestion and implements the compacts directive to reduce the region's reliance on the automobile. TRPA formed the Tahoe Living Housing Working Group to bring housing interests together. And we're making changes to our regional plan to encourage the full range of workforce housing. Uh, some examples specifically from accessory dwelling units on single family properties, as well as other strategies. We do this work with partners to deliver new affordable and workforce housing. We're working with partners like the Mountain Housing Council, the North Shore, the Tahoe Prosperity Center, St. Joseph's Community Land Trust here on the South Shore. One recent example of, our, of that growing success, last year, our board approved a 250 unit mixed rate affordable housing project in, uh, in South Lake that we permitted in record time. And we're gonna use that collaborative model and apply it to future projects. Projects like these are part of strengthening our community element of our regional plan and tying transportation and land use together so that our local workers can afford to live in quality housing close to where they work without having to drive off the hill. One last initiative, but very important, we have an overarching climate initiative called Building Resilience. This is where all of our initiatives are implemented with a climate resiliency focus. We collaborate with EIP partners and we're launching a climate resiliency action plan 
that builds off of Tahoe's updated greenhouse gas emissions report that we released last year. Our transportation system implementation, like the deployment of our electric vehicle charging infrastructure is all developed to support the state's goals in GHG emissions. One final programmatic mention, technology is transforming the way we do business. The pandemic changed the way most public agencies engage with the public, TRPA too ramped up, and we now have electronic permit applications and online customer service. Last year, more than 80% of our applications were processed online and it improves efficiency and reduces car trips. Technology is also giving us the capability for real-time reporting and tracking. So we have an online dashboard at laketahoeinfo.org that houses all of our current data on threshold standards, as well as current information about the hundreds of active projects of the EIP. And it's through this portal that your constituents can actually access TRPA's permit, their permit history and property data through a parcel tracker. So let me close today with um, a quick snapshot of TRPA's budget uh, for the 21-22 fiscal year. Our total budget is 19.4 million. The bulk of our general fund, 9.3 million in general fund comes from appropriations by the two states with an increment from fees for service that we that come from reviewing development projects. Our special funds roughly are 40, 47% of our budget and that comes predominantly from grant funding. Our contracts keep our uh, level and lean uh, and flexible enough to respond to the expected fluctuations in program needs. And we make request, uh, appropriations requests from Nevada and California in a ratio of two thirds California and one third Nevada share. And because of budget cuts in the last two cycles, Nevada is currently $400,000 short on its one third funding share to TRPA's operating budget and is supporting uh, roughly 23% of TRPA's current general fund. So we hope to work with you on solutions to this budget shortfall through the interim. And I wanna thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Ms. Marquetta. We appreciate all of that information. You guys do quite a lot of work up there. Um, I wanna uh, just echo that water quality is is really a criteria issue. Um, and I'm, I'm right there with you in the importance of it. My family has adopted what we can, including um, reef safe sunscreen and adopting sunscreen shirts instead of applying sunscreen to try our best to help with those clarity issues that we're continuing to see at the lake. Are there any questions from the members on Ms. Marquetta's uh, presentation? I do not see any questions from members yet, but, oh, I'm sorry, Assemblywoman Krasner, please go ahead. Thank you very much for that excellent presentation, Ms. Keller. Um, so I just had a quick question regarding the two fires, the Caldor fire and the Angora fire. Do you feel that we have adequate um, fire protection? Do we need more firefighters in the Lake Tahoe area, in your opinion? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I would leave it to the fire districts to speak to firefighting capacity, but I can tell you this, Tahoe is, is organized is any region uh, around fire and fuels uh, work. You saw we've done 67,000 acres. We coordinate every year uh, around um, seeking funding. And so we've just uh, received um, uh, grants or, or commitments to grants from the Southern Nevada Public Lands Management Act that's gonna let us significantly expand our, our forest and forest health and, and fire treatments uh, in the Tahoe Basin. So the work that we do is, is highly coordinated. I'm sure that the fire districts would say we can always use more firefighting capacity, but I'm not gonna answer that for them. Thank you, Ms. Marquetta. 
Thank you, Assemblywoman Krasner, for the question. I think I just want to highlight, um, lastly, the budget deficit issue. And this time around, we have a couple of us on IFC and the fiscal committees. Um, and so we are listening to that. Um, and we'll have uh, future conversations, I imagine, on that particular issue. Are there any other questions from the committee? I'm not seeing any. So I'm going to go ahead and thank you so much for the presentation. We look forward to seeing you in person potentially next time around. Um, and I will move us on to our next agenda item, agenda item seven. This is an update on the Nevada California bi state collaboration related to the Lake Tahoe Basin. We have presenters Jim Lawrence, our own Jim Lawrence, and Brian Cash from California. You are ready. Let's see them priming up here. Please go ahead and proceed when you are ready. I thank you, Chair Peters and the rest of the committee. My name is Jim Lawrence, and I serve as one of the deputy directors here for the Nevada Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Um, with me, um, joining me for the meeting today is also Brian Cash. Brian Cash serves as the second assistant secretary for administration and finance for the California Natural Resources Agency. Got a short presentation talking about some of the, um, the main topics that both CNRA and the Nevada DCNR are working on jointly. Uh, we have a very long history of collaboration between the two states um, regarding Lake Tahoe issues. Um, dating way back as uh, Director Marquetta pointed out with passage of the Tahoe Regional Planning Compact, which is really the two states getting together. Um, at the time it was Governor Reagan for California and Governor Laxalt for Nevada. Um, recognizing the importance of Lake Tahoe to the two states and the importance of protecting Lake Tahoe. Um, I think another kind of sort of highlight of the collaboration is um, the states committed to the Environmental Improvement Program back in 1997. That was done through a memorandum of understanding, again, between the two governors of the states, um, recognizing that change had to happen at Lake Tahoe and that we need to get more aggressive with environmental improvement projects and getting more into the area of doing environmental restoration and not relying so much on regulation. Um, I think the next time when the states really had to get together on collaboration was um, in 2011 um, and 2012. Um, in 2011, some of you might remember or recall that Nevada passed SB 271 at the time which called for um, Nevada to possibly pull out of the compact if there was not a regional plan update done by the end of 2012. Um, certainly the importance of um, Lake Tahoe to both administrations um, got the two states in high gear. And between Secretary Laird um, with CNRA and then my boss at the time, Director Drozdoff with DCNR, uh, we held a series of meetings over two years to really get to the sticking points of the regional plan update. And we were able to successfully resolve that. And as um, Director Marquetta pointed out, the regional plan update was adopted in 2012. Um, currently, 2015 to current, um, we are working together, basically putting science to action. And there is a bi-state Tahoe Science Advisory Council, and I'll touch more on that. That's really to take a look at it, putting science into our decision making. And then lastly, there is the ongoing bi-state consultation on transportation, which I will touch on um, a little bit more in a couple of slides. So three areas I do want to just touch on is climate, science, and then transportation. I, um, the Environmental Improvement Program, the EIP, is certainly something that we work closely on collaboration, but since you'll be getting a more detailed presentation after I speak, um, I'll leave that up to the presenters there. Regarding climate, um, certainly climate change or the impacts of climate to the environment has always been baked into the regional plan, into our decision making. But I think some of the recent changes um, and some of the climate patterns is really accelerating the need to take a look at how we incorporate climate into our land use plans and into our environmental restoration activities. I really want to express my 
uh, appreciation in California, both CNRA in partnership with the California Crop Conservancy. They recently led a collaboration um, for the adoption of a Tahoe Climate Adaptation Action Portfolio that really documents exactly what we've been doing to date to incorporate climate into decision making. And then also a climate vulnerability assessment to take a look at the areas that might be the most vulnerable to the um, change of climate. With those documents and some other documents, TRPA is leading a collaboration for a Tahoe Climate Resilience Strategy. States are gonna be involved in that. We wanna make sure that that Tahoe Resilience Strategy aligns with both Nevada and California climate strategies. And where the, really the climate is gonna be touching on some of the issues, and, and Director Marquetta did talk a little bit about this, changing climate um, with sustainable recreation. Um, what does that mean for winter sports? And what does that mean for the winter tourism economy? Um, conversely, what does that mean for the summer tourism economy, where we have found over the last couple of years as temperatures increase in the valleys, more and more folks are going to Lake Tahoe to recreate, and that creates its own challenges. Um, certainly the climate um, has uh, some challenges regarding watershed resilience, whether it's forest health and dangers to um, catastrophic wildfire, um, but also lake clarity and water quality. What, um, we have learning from the science community, we know like the lake has not mixed for the last few years, meaning the deep water has not come up to the top and the top water has not gone down to the bottom. Absent mixing, we're finding that that has impact for lake clarity. And, and certainly we need to look at our infrastructure and protecting our vulnerable communities as well. So climate is one of the areas where we are collaborating. And then I do want to touch on science because we do think it's critical to use science to inform our decision making when we're talking about environmental restoration activities. So as I spoke earlier, there is a memorandum of understanding from 2015 between Nevada Conservation and Natural Resources and California Natural Resource Agencies that establishes a Tahoe Science Advisory Council. The one if I had to say the primary goal for this council, and that is to integrate science and management. Um, we don't need a situation at Lake Tahoe where science is not collaborated or it's independent, and then the decision makers don't get the best science to incorporate into our plans. So that is one of the primary goals is to create that forum. Along with that, the, um, the council has been working in, in a number of areas that are very beneficial to both states and, as well as um, just the Tahoe environment. One is a TRPA threshold update. Um, Director Marquette touched on this briefly, uh, but uh, I would add that, you know, these threshold standards, you know, they were adopted about 40 years ago. And I think, um, you know, they were, they were developed with the best information at the time. There's about 150 standard and indicate standards and indicators below the thresholds. And some of those have just been antiquated and they need to be brought up to date to today's standards. I use, for example, vehicle miles traveled. Um, the Science Council was very instrumental in, in updating the vehicle miles traveled standard. So now it reflects 2021 conditions and 2022 conditions and not 1980 conditions. Council's also been very valuable in peer review. They did the peer review for the environmental impact statement from Tahoe Peace Project to make sure that the monitoring protocols and the plan for action is soundly based in science. They're also geared for emerging issues. We had the Caldor Fire, um, the Science Council through different universities like University um, Nevada Reno. Um, they were able to coalesce quickly and put together projects regarding monitoring the smoke impacts for Lake Clarity. Um, they're still doing that project and analyzing the data, um, but they're able to kind of take a look at this as we have emerging issues to move forward. They also provide consultation to different management agencies. Um, for instance, they've been doing some remote sensing work for some of the California agencies. Um, I do, I would be remiss if I did not point out that funding the base operations, basically funding the meetings, um, the excellent work of the director, um, to make sure that this all works seamlessly, um, has been a challenge um, to find those base operations. Um, and so we're hopeful that we can do that in the future, find some sustainable funding for them, because the work that they've been doing is very important. And then the last um, area of collaboration that I'll touch on is transportation, which um, 
you know, it's been particularly challenging. We have had bi-state transportation discussions that have began in 2017. We have not met continuously during that time. We did take a break for a period of time, also with uh, sort of the COVID protocols that got a little challenging for a little while. But the, um, you know, bottom line, and I think Director Mark kind of touched on this as well, is the roadway capacity of the basin is continuously exceeded during peak traffic lines. So that's usually during heavy visitation. The roadway system, um, challenging that, the roadway system really can't be expanded. I mean, because of the topography um, and so the conditions out there, it's not possible, nor is it, I don't think it would be the best solution, just simply widen highways in order to get more capacity. So that makes it a challenge. The other challenge is, um, you know, I like the slide that Director Marquetta put up showing the different jurisdictions, the two states, the five local <laughs> jurisdictions. Finding sustainable funding and funding a transportation system that is seamless to the user. The user really doesn't care which county they're in. They just want to go around Lake Tahoe and, and visit. Um, so being able to set up a transit system across these different jurisdictions is, has been quite a challenge. Um, but we do have a regional transportation plan that was adopted in 2021. The primary goal of the regional transportation plan, due to the constraints of roadway capacity, is to really focus on different modes of transportation, whether it be transit services, bike paths, shuttle services, even ferry services. The idea is to get folks out of the single occupancy vehicle um, in order to help protect the Tahoe environment and reduce the congestion on the highways. The, um, we have identified that there is an annual funding gap of about $20 million to implement that regional transportation plan. And so that's, you know, that's a pretty huge gap in our bi-state transportation group is really working on coming together to find consensus on the best revenue sources for funding that gap. We do have consensus on top priority projects. Um, for Nevada side of the basin, um, one of the two top priority projects is completion of the State Route 28 corridor plan. That's basically the highway between Incline Village and then going south to Spooner Summit. It is primarily recreational beaches and it includes Lake Tahoe, Nevada State Parks, and Harbor. Um, this is where we get a, most of our traffic congestion in the summer months. Um, and the parking on the roadside and all of the issues that come with the traffic congestion is, um, is really having an environmental damage to, to the Tahoe. So um, while we do have consensus on the top priority projects, um, we do, like I said earlier, we need more work to arrive at funding gaps consensus. At our last meeting of the Bi-State consultation, um, we did have some momentum regarding how to sort of split up the, um, the sort of the, the shared responsibility of funding transportation. Um, I think there was general consensus that using the environmental improvement program model where everybody collaborates their share, um, that we would look at a split of what we call seven, seven, and seven. And, you know, for the states to, to try to identify between Nevada and California, an additional $7 million. Um, local governments and private sector an additional seven and then the federal government an additional seven one of the uh, there's lots of challenges with this um but one of the other challenges is you know to find the rtp we're looking at a mixture of infrastructure funding in order to get the actual infrastructure in place and the capital improvements in place but then the ongoing operations that go along with operating a transit system bus drivers funding for um you know, anything that goes along with the operations, including maintenance facilities and things like that, finding those dollars can be more challenging. Between Nevada and California regarding infrastructure, we have been um, really working hard with PRPA staff and Tahoe Transportation District staff, um, as well as our congress congressional delegation and talking to them about opportunities and really looking hard at the different infrastructure packages so that we can get some, at least the needed infrastructure and foundational stuff in place. And hopefully we can find some funding for those needs. And then um, lastly, on the transportation, um, Elisa Keller did mention SCRA from last session. 
Um, that requires the bi state group to come back and report on project priorities, project costs, benefits, funding recommendation, and implementation barriers. There's a lot of work there. A lot of work has been done, um, but we're still working on the final package. And we are looking forward to coming back at a future meeting and we'll give you, um, if the committee desired, a more maybe in depth discussion on the transportation issues in the final list. And then there's um, my contact information and Mr. Cash's um, contact information. With that, I kind of went through a lot of information fairly quickly. Um, happy to answer any questions, or perhaps um, Mr. Cash would want to say something on California. I'd just like to take a second to express my appreciation for Jim and the Department of Conservation and all the support that we're getting from everyone in the, that's working with us in Nevada. It's a great partnership and um, just look forward to continuing to working with you in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Cash, and thank you, Mr. Lauren. Um, are there any questions from the committee? I'm looking. I want to just say that I was aware of the STR 8. Um, hold up and request to extend to the next meeting. And I think that that's appropriate. Um, we really do hope that you come up with some solutions to bring to the table for that transportation funding piece. It is a, really a crux issue in the Tahoe Basin. Um, and we've got to find ways to get uh, to figure out what will work for the community and, um, and ensure that folks can continue to visit while um, retaining that, that uh, limited infrastructure need up there or um, space up there. I'm not seeing any questions popping up from my committee. So I'd like to just extend a thank you so much for presenting on this, um, on the Bi-State Collaboration. I really appreciate all of the work that you do in the Basin. Thank you so much for working together. I know that it can't, can't be easy to have as many entities in the same uh, pot of soup. <laughs> Um, but you guys do manage to, to make some good things come out of that process. So really appreciate all of your work and collaboration. And I'm going to go ahead and close out agenda item seven and move on to agenda item eight, which is an overview. Let me see, make sure I'm on the right one. Yes, an overview of the environmental improvement program and of the related Nevada programs. Our presenter on this agenda item is Charlie Donahue, who's the administrator with the Division of State Lands. Um, and he has a couple of others, I believe, with him. Mr. Donahue, not seeing, here we go. I think they're ready. Go ahead and start whenever you're ready. Hi, uh, good afternoon, um, Madam Chair Peters and committee members. I believe we had um, spoken with staff to have TRPA go first because they're going to give the broader overview. And then we'll be talking about the Nevada portion of the EIP, if that's okay with uh, the chair. Yes, absolutely. Sorry, we're we'll going to go ahead and start with TRPA. Please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. I believe that's me, Kimberly Carringer. I'm going to just take a second to share my screen. One second. Okay, can you see and hear me? Yes, it looks great. Wonderful. Okay, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Good afternoon. My name is Kimberly Carringer. I am the Environmental Improvement Division Manager here at the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency. And as Joanne mentioned, uh, for 25 years now, partners across the basin have worked together to restore and protect the Lake Tahoe region. And this strong collaborative partnership has implemented hundreds of projects to improve water quality, the health of our forests, improve access to our public lands and revitalize our local communities. And I'm excited today just to dive into the details a little bit more. Everyone set a great foundation for me. So I will just give a brief history of the, how the program works, how we set our priorities and what we have planned for the future. So first off, history, uh, many of you know this well and have been part of it um, as the EIP has grown and matured over the last 25 years. Back in 1997, the lake's clarity was declining at a faster pace than any one jurisdiction could manage. 
And it was at this time that Lake Tahoe really uh, faced an environmental emergency. TRPA led the charge to develop a list of environmental improvement projects that we needed to enact really immediately um, to avert losing the lake. And the two states worked together to get the attention at the federal level and welcomed President Clinton and uh, Vice President Al Gore to really see the first these issues firsthand and commit the federal partnership to joining and to be part of this solution. And it was here that our first Lake Tahoe summit was born and the environmental improvement program was born with the all hands on deck approach for every sector committed to be part of to being part of funding and implementing it. And I want to talk a little bit about partnerships. We talk a lot about it here in Tahoe. It is and it's because it's probably the single biggest factor that makes this program successful. You'll hear, you hear a lot today about landscape scale collaboration and working across, across boundaries. And Lake Tahoe really was one of the first collaboratives in the nation to embrace this way of completing environmental restoration and protection. Instead of following just agency boundaries, we follow the watershed boundary. And you see here the map of how the partnership has grown over the last 25 years. It's now over 80 partners strong, and all of these entities help plan, fund, and implement projects, and it's all housed under one umbrella, the Environmental Improvement Program. We set our priorities together, we fund projects together, we coordinate implementation, and we track our progress and outcomes together. And so I'll talk a little bit about the four main program areas and focus areas of the EIP. It's evolved a lot since that big list of projects at the beginning. Uh, the first one being watersheds and water quality. And Joanne gave a really good tee up of this focus area. Uh, we focus on reducing stormwater pollution into the lake. We focus on restoring our meadows and tributaries. We focus on preventing aquatic invasive species from entering the lake and controlling the ones that are currently in the lake. And in each of these areas, just to give you an example of the type of projects that we work on for reducing stormwater pollution into the lake, at the beginning, it was as simple as adding curb and gutter to our highways on both states. And a lot of uh, other areas might take something like that for granted, but we didn't have all of that in place right at the beginning when we started the EIP. And we can now say that curb and cutter is now installed in all of our major highways, and we're continually working on more sophisticated approaches to reducing stormwater and naturally fil filtering it before it gets to the lake. A key part of that also is restoring our meadows and tributaries. Here you see a picture of the upper Truckee River Marsh, which was uh, the California Tahoe Conservancy just broke ground on restoring this meadow last year. But this river corridor is one of our biggest priorities as it crosses multiple jurisdictions and has been a, and has been a collaborative undertaking for the last 10 years. And on the Nevada side, similarly, Third Creek has been one of our major focuses uh, in the Incline Village area and has undergone a few different phases of restoration to restore its natural alignment and improve wildlife habitat. And lastly, I'll mention aquatic invasive species. Our boat inspection, can, our boat inspection program continues to evolve over the last uh, decade. We are focused now on establishing permanent inspection stations with the top of Spooner being our top priority to establish our first permanent station there. Forest Health, again, Joanne spoke a lot about how we approach the management of our forests here in Tahoe. Since the Angora Fire in 2008, we established the Tahoe Fire and Fuels Team as a collaborative multi-jurisdictional partnership. And since then, tens of thousands of acres have been treated in Tahoe using hand fitting, mechanical equipment, prescribed fire, even helicopter logging. Tons of work has been happening across the entire basin here. And it's through that strategic work by the Tahoe Fire and Fuels team that, it, that played an enormous role in protecting Lake Tahoe from the Caldor Fire last year. It has been clearly mapped on how fire behavior changed when it entered the areas that have been thinned and how the work that homeowners did to implement defensible space and replace old shake roofs, help save Christmas Valley. And it's now, now more clear than ever how important this work is and the continuing need to in, continue to increase the pace and scale of it. I will also mention water infrastructure as a major priority of this area. 
Many of our many of our water systems are small or underaged and just under capacity to deliver the amount of water you would need to fight a fire um, when it, if it enters the basin. And in Calder's case, the South Tahoe Public Utility District was well equipped, but that wouldn't be the case everywhere. Uh, the Cave Rock system is on, on the Nevada side is one of the top priority EIP projects we have in this focus area. And Douglas County has made great progress on the first phases of planning and implementation of that upgrade, but additional funding and partnerships will be needed to complete that one as well as the many others we need to upgrade to uh, be prepared in the event of catastrophic wildfire. Okay, and then sustainable recreation and transportation. I will be brief because this has been spoken about a few times, but I'll just highlight that the first phase of the EIP, we really focused on uh, increasing public access to the lake and our public lands and really improving our public rec facilities. And we have made a ton of progress there. You can see those improvements firsthand at, at our popular beaches, such as Santa Harbor and Round Hill on the Nevada side that have really completed some amazing upgrades to improve the visitor experience and, and increase visitor management. And we've also made some major progress on the transportation side when it comes to getting people out of their cars and uh, onto their bikes or onto their feet. We have completed about half of the pedestrian multi-use trail that we envision around the lake with one of the major links being completed last year, the Incline to Sand Harbor link, about three miles, which was a big undertaking public-private partnership. And I'm sure many of you have gotten to experience and walk that trail. Um, and we have plans to continue to finish some of these big links that we need to finish the Tahoe Trail, including around Emerald Bay and places like Crystal Bay on the Nevada side. And lastly, I'll talk about science, stewardship, and accountability. The EIP has a strong scientific foundation that helps guide our management decisions and monitor and track our progress and implement adaptive management, including Including science and monitoring in all of our EIP projects allows us to quickly adapt to really see what is working and what's not working and why, so we can adapt quickly. Our science, par our science partners have helped us uh, find out the root of what causes some of the environmental degradation we are trying to fix and helps us determine the best ways to solve it. And I'll give you some examples. We currently have scientists exploring how rising temperatures affect lake clarity. You heard about that from Jim Lawrence and Joanne. And we also incorporate that into our management where we have scientists track the spread of invasive weeds, what drives their growth. And our science partners are also part of our cohesive stewardship programs, UNR, Turk, the Tahoe Natural Institute of Sciences, the League of State Lake Tahoe, Tahoe Fund. We all work together to develop and implement stewardship programs for the public that help us clean up litter or complete wildlife surveys or help track those invasive weeds I've talked about. Um, all of these partners have helped to contribute to and develop our messaging through the Take Care campaign, um, which improves our overall science stewardship and accountability program in a cohesive way. And I will touch uh, base on accountability in my next couple slides. For funding to date, 25 years later since the inception of the EIP, we've invested over 2.6 billion in this program combined. And you can see that split here among partners and sectors here you see the federal, state, local, private uh, contributions. And while that number can seem big, it actually tracks really well with our initial estimates of the EIP in that in the first 10 years, we estimated a 900 million cost estimate for all of the projects needed to implement our first phase goals. And that was the first 10 years. Second 10 years cost about the same and we are in our third set. So we're tracking right along that original cost estimate, cost estimate of 2.6 or the first estimate of 900 million now being 2.6. So with that, you can see um, just last year, the TRPA and the Tahoe Fund and the League to Lake, Save Lake Tahoe worked together to commission an economic analysis of what this investment has done to date and not just for the environment, but for our economies. Here you can see from that 2.6 billion investment, it's a 5.2 billion um, outcome in total economic output to the region since 1997. And that report showed that the EIP supports an average of 1,700 jobs a year. Really, 1 million in EIP spending generates 1.6 million in total economic output. And that output doesn't just count for 
within the watershed, all of that output generates these economic benefits to the surrounding counties, including Washoe, Carson City, Douglas County, Alpine County, El Dorado, and Placer County. And for tracking and accountability, I think it was seven years ago that I did my first presentation to this committee. And that was when we had first launched the EIP tracker and LT info. And this tool makes all of that EIP investment and accomplishments transparent to the public, to funders and to decision makers. And a unique aspect we have in the EIP is as a partnership, we all have agreed to a set of shared EIP performance measures that every implementer reports on each year. We account for how many forest acres we treat, how, the amount of stormwater pollution reduced, the amount of boat inspections we complete as part of the AIS program. Those are just some examples. And here in this graph, you'll see the amount of defensible space inspections that the Tahoe Fire and Fuels team completed um, over the last 10 years. And I'll note that it was the highest ever in 2021. And I do invite you to please go to laketahoeinfo.org and really poke around here a little bit and look at these different portals that really can show you clearly uh, in a really visual way our progress and accomplishments. The Lake Tahoe Summit, as I mentioned, the first Lake Tahoe Summit occurred in 1997 and it still continued every year to, to this day. It is through this summit that the full partnership physically gets together and TRPA through the EIP tracker annually reports on our funding and our accomplishments through the partnership, which drives our upcoming priorities. We look forward to this event every year to do that annual check-in and continue to drive the prioritization of the, of the projects we implement through the program. Here you see some shots from last year, which was hosted by U.S. Senator Alex Padilla with a special keynote speaker, Secretary Holland from the U.S. Department of Interior. So I'll just summarize my slides with just to highlight some of these big accomplishments because it's truly remarkable what this partnership has accomplished and achieved over the last 25 years. We have truly averted catastrophic wildfire from destroying our communities through our work on forest health. We have also averted any new aquatic invasive species being introduced into the lake through our nationally recognized boat inspection program. Uh, we also have exceeded targets to reduce the amount of stormwater pollution that's flowing into the lake. We have stabilized the clarity loss of the lake. We have completed more than half of that multi-use path that we envision around the lake. And, and we have a, a cohesive approach to our stewardship and messaging program through the Take Care campaign. And we've now established a Tahoe Science Advisory Council that is really guiding and um, guiding the implementation of the EIP. And just to look forward into our future priorities as we implement the EIP, our threats and our, is and our issues that we face do change over time. Today, we are, are, are already seeing the effects of climate change on the lake and our biggest priority is increasing the pace and scale of restoration to make our region healthy and resilient to, to withstand things like drought and wildfire and other threats. We also need sustainable funding strategies. We've accomplished a lot of planning and budget forecasting, but finding reliable sources that can fund programs over time allows us the ability to plan together more efficiently, guarantee smooth implementation and leverage each other's funding dollars. And finally, I'll end with partnership building because that priority never goes away and it takes constant care and time to make this collaborative work together and stay committed. And I'm really looking forward to continuing to build on the strong foundation we have built over the last 25 years to continue this program. So I'll wrap there. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love a good presentation with highlights on successes. I think it's really important that we acknowledge how our efforts are being put to use and the benefits to our communities from those efforts. Um, and then look to the future of when we invest more, what expectations can we, what can we uh, have of those efforts in the future? We still have a long way to go. Tahoe is a very vulnerable component of our state um, and, and of our region. And it's really important that we continue to work towards those broader goals um, and maybe more nuanced goals of the region. Mr. Donahue, did you have additional uh, presentation or statements you'd like to make on this piece too? Yes, um, Chairwoman Peters, I, I do. I actually was going to introduce the Nevada portion of the EIP and then hand it over to my colleague, Deputy Administrator 
how would we stall it if that's appropriate? Yeah, I, uh, before we jump into that, does anybody have any questions on the California por portion of the EIP? Go ahead, Senator, Senator Settlemeyer. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was curious, you brought up the concept of the Tahoe Summit. I was curious if this year it was going to be live or it was going to be virtual again, if anyone knew. I can jump in and answer that. I think it's still in plan. And uh, over the last couple of years, we have had great success in allowing an online portion as well as in person. So I think we're working on trying that integrated approach again. I appreciate that. Last year, it seemed that it was uh, rather difficult for individuals to try to make it personally. It was kind of uh, very low attendance and physical capacity. I was hoping this year it would be more readily available for individuals. I, I agree with keeping the online portion as well because it allows people to attend from all over. However, I was hope, looking forward to the concept of the live in-person presentations. I think there's more gain that way. Thank you. I, I was able to attend this last year um, and it was a beautiful day. I got sunburned a little bit. It was like the one break we had in wildfire for uh, most of the summer. It was um, pretty spectacular up there. All right, any other questions for California and Ms. Carringer? I'm seeing none. Thank you, Ms. Carringer. I will go ahead um, and pass it on to Mr. Donahue, if you want to go ahead. Yes, thank you, uh, Chairwoman Peters and committee members. Great, thank you, Elder. Uh, I'm Charlie Donahue, and I serve as the administrator for the Nevada Division of State Lands. I've had the pleasure of working in different capacities uh, in the IEP for over 20 years now, and, uh, and also serving on the Nevada Tahoe Resource Team. Today, Lands is here to speak with you about how Nevada implements its portion of the EIP. Uh, as I indicated before, um, I'm here with our Deputy Administrator, Ellery Stoller, who will be presenting our programs this afternoon. And at the end of that presentation, uh, both she and I would be more than happy to answer any of your questions. I'm going to turn it over to Ellery now. Okay. Thank you, Charlie. And thank you, Chair Peters and members of the committee. Um, again, my name is Ellery Stoller, and I'm the Deputy Administrator for the Division of State Lands. And you just heard um, from Kim about the EIP from a regional perspective, I'd like to share a little bit more information about EIP implementation in Nevada. Um, for background, the EIP was established in 1999 through the Fund to Protect Lake Tahoe Basin. We work in five program areas, water quality, forest health, sensitive species, aquatic invasive species control, and sustainable recreation. This work is primarily funded through the sale of general obligation bonds approved by legislation. In 2009 through AB 18, the legislature renewed the state's commitment to the EIP by establishing 100 million in bond authority over the subsequent 10 years. SB 197 in 2017 extended that 10 year deadline to issue bonds until June 30, 2030. Bond authority under the $100 million cap is approved by the legislature in installments based on a schedule established by the administrator of the Division of State Lands. And once an installment is approved, bond sales are coordinated through the state treasurer's office. And so far, $28.4 million of the $100 million in authority has been authorized, and we have about $71.6 million in authority remaining. So who implements the Nevada EIP? The Nevada Division of State Lands houses a multidisciplinary, multi-agency team called the Nevada Tahoe Resource Team. This includes representatives from the Division of State Lands, Division of Forestry, Department of Wildlife, and State Parks. NTRT members lead projects in their fields of expertise and they coordinate among each other and with basin partners to implement the EIP. Each member contributes their expertise, and we like to say that they bring their agency with them in order to strengthen projects and make them even more holistic. 
So for example, our NDF forester and our NDAL wildlife biologist, they work closely together on the Spooner Landscape Resilience Project. The forester looked through the lens of wildfire mitigation and tree stand diversity, and the wildlife biologist viewed the project in terms of habitat value and protecting sensitive species. They walked the entire project area jointly deciding which trees should be marked for removal so that they could at once mitigate fire risk while also preserving quality habitat. So this type of collaboration is a hallmark of our team. The NTRT implements EIP projects directly. We also run a water quality grant program, which provides funding to other state and local governments for their own stormwater improvement, stream restoration, and erosion control projects. The picture you see on this slide is of Cave Rock in the Lake Tahoe Nevada State Park. Um, we experience high visitation at this park, and as a result, there have been some unauthorized cut through trails that go along this slope of, uh, above the beach. So we are working um, to direct visitors to the park entrance by, by installing temporary and long-term fencing. And we are also stabilizing and revegetating the slope of approximately 1,200 square feet of eroded slopes and user-created trails. This work will reduce a source of sediment that is directly adjacent to the lake. We are also continue, continuing capital improvements at the Spooner unit of Lake Tahoe Nevada State Park. And here you see construction of the new visitor center. This was um, constructed last summer and continues to be developed. Um, EIP bonds are also funding the development of a new amphitheater. Construction of this, of this phase uh, is anticipated to be completed by the end of this year. And then construction of phase two of Spooner Front Country, which includes trails, picnic areas, and non-motorized boat ramp and fishing platform is expected to begin this summer. Improvements are also envisioned in the Van Sickle unit of the state park. NTRT and state parks are currently scheduling the planning and design of multiple phases of development, including residences for park staff, expanded front country trails and day use parking. We are also working within the Lake Tahoe Nevada State Park to reduce wildfire risk and improve forest health. We recently submitted a $1.4 million proposal uh, for Smithmore Round 19. This is for the Marlette Hazardous Fuels Reduction Project. This project would treat 450 acres in two large segments near Marlette Lake to reduce the risk, sorry, to reduce the risk of wildland fire that um, could come upslope from the south or the southwest. And work would include thinning areas of dense conifers, reducing surface fuels, and pile burning. So speaking of pile burning, NDF crews are currently burning tiles at Spooner from the Spooner Landscape Resiliency Project um, while they have the weather window to do so. We are also working with state parks to implement defensible space treatments near buildings and infrastructure at Sand Harbor. And this work will make the area of the park more resilient and more defendable. One of our most significant recent projects with respect to aquatic invasive species was the installation of benthic barriers at Sand Harbor to control the invasive Asian clam. In partnership with TRPA, we treated 10 acres of the lake bottom between 2017 and 2020. We treated the lake bottom with these large mats that you can see on the lower left picture here. Um, those maps depleted the lake substrate of dissolved oxygen, um, which um, has the uh, effect of killing the Asian clams. So our initial monitoring indicated 99% mortality of Asian clams underneath the barriers. We removed the barriers in 2020, 
and are currently monitoring for potential recolonization through an agreement with the University of Nevada, Reno. You've heard this project mentioned a couple of times before, the SR-28 Scenic Byway. It includes continuation of the East Shore Trail from Sand Harbor to Spooner. This project would not only provide a dedicated pedestrian bike path separated from traffic, but would also include parking areas, transit, and reduce traffic congestion. Um, it would also improve water quality by helping pr to prevent people from parking um, on the shoulder in the dirt. The project identifies a permanent boat inspection station as well across from Spooner um, with additional parking there as well. Federal infrastructure funds are being pursued for this project. We believe a portion of the EIP's remaining bond authority could contribute towards the state's share of this project as well. So I wanted to give you a quick status update of where we are with, um, with our bond funds. Um, our EIP projects are currently being funded by bonds sold in 2019 under Senate Bill 438. And we anticipate fully expending those 2019 bonds by the end of this summer. There is an additional 12 million in bond authority combined between AB 220 and SB 368. And of this 12 million bond authority, 5.1 million has been sold in 2021. And the remaining about 7 million is um, anticipated, we hope will be sold in November 22. This, this chart shows a history of Tahoe bonds since the passage of AB 18 in 2009 that established that $100 million cap. Um, the red bars indicate bond authority authorized by the legislature, and the green bars are bond sales completed through the treasurer's office. You'll see a blue line that cuts through. This indicates EIP project expenditures year over year. Um, expenditure on major capital projects, including the Spooner Front Country Recreation Project and Washoe County's Lowerwood Creek Water Quality Project, um, Projects such as this account for the rise that you see in 2021 and 2022. We use a number of different platforms to share program performance and the investment of EIP bonds. This includes the EIP tracker, which Kim Carringer mentioned earlier. Um, this is an online dashboard maintained by the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency, which is updated annually by EIP partners, including us, the Nevada Tahoe Resource Team. We also produce semi-annual bond reports to the state treasurer's office, including cash flow projections. And we also provide a semi-annual report on project implementation and our bonds to the interim finance committee. Over the 2024-2025 biennium, we would initially request $6 million in general obligation bond authority to continue carrying out the EIP. And by the end of the interim, we imagine this value may be higher as we learn more this spring about um, the SR-28 scenic byway and a little bit more about Van Sickle planning. Um, we um, we plan to continue to engage with our uh, program partners as well as this committee as we further develop this request. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions, and I know Charlie would as well. Thank you so much for the presentation. I do want to just clarify earlier, I said that Ms. Karen Drew was with, the, with California, and she's with TRPA. My fault. I apologize, Ms. Karen Drew. Um, are there any questions from the committee on from the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources presentation? I am not seeing any. Thank you so much for the presentation. The coordination efforts you guys do um, within the state agencies is really impressive and, and important. We appreciate your effort on that as well. And look forward to talking more about what we can be doing to help 
in this next um, in this next next legislative session. Okay. No. Conversation. Hopefully in person. You can may see some of the programs you guys are working on up at the up at the lake. I'm going to go ahead and uh, close agenda item eight and move on to agenda item nine. Thank you both so much, um, and Ms. Kander as well. Agenda item nine is a presentation regarding private sector environmental improvement program contributions. This um, agenda item, um, we decided to include a private entity because of the consistent private public partnerships that occur in the basin and the importance of these entities in assisting in the programs that we've been hearing about from TRPA and the states. Um, Last interim, we heard from the League to Save Lake Tahoe. So this interim, we decided to invite the Tahoe Fund to present today. I believe Amy Berry is here with the Tahoe Fund. And I will go ahead and ask you to begin whenever you're ready. Great. Let me share my screen. Hi, everyone. Does that look okay? Looks great. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, hi everyone. I'm Amy Berry, CEO of the Tahoe Fund. It's great to be here today. Uh, going last means that you've probably heard a lot of um, what I'm going to touch on, so I'll go really quickly for everybody, but please stop me if you have any questions. Uh, the Tahoe Fund is a nonprofit. Uh, we're celebrating our 12th year this year, and we were started to help get the private community engaged in all of this work that's happening in the basin. Uh, our mission is to use the power of philanthropy to improve the Lake Tahoe environment for all to enjoy. So what does that mean, the power of philanthropy? Well, in, since our founding, we've raised over $10 million of private funding, but the power of that philanthropy is that we've helped secure over $50 million of public funding for incredible projects all around the lake, many of which you've already heard about today, and I'll, I'll focus on a few for you as well. Uh, we have, you've heard a lot of, there's so many different focus areas around the lake that people are working on for the Tahoe Fund. Our board has selected these five areas in our strategic plan. Um, and as you heard many say today, everything's important, um, but for the Tahoe Fund, forest health is our number one priority. If we burn down the forest, we're, we're going to lose a lot. We're going to lose lake clarity. We're going to lose our recreation. We're, no one's going to come to the lake, so we don't have to worry about transportation. Uh, so we are trying really hard to help our partners increase the pace and scale of restoring our forests uh, to try to prevent catastrophic wildfire. We are an organization focused on projects. How can we get more environmental and pro improvement projects completed around the lake by working with all of our partners? Um, this map you'll see is probably looks like an eye chart, apologies, but we're over 60 different projects that we've helped fund. And when I say we, that's our private donor pool of individuals, second homeowners, uh, businesses, most of the Tahoe businesses are very supportive of the Tahoe Fund as well. Um, it's great. And I just wanted to point out, so the, the flags in the middle are projects that support the entire lake, but you'll see 13 flags specifically on the Nevada side. So those are a number of different projects that we've worked on with our partners to help make happen on the Nevada side and wanted to share a few of those with you. Uh, but first, I love this slide because, and I don't think we even captured them on all on here, but I, you, as you heard Joanne talk about and Kim Carringer and Charlie, you know, epic collaboration is really what makes Tahoe so successful. And this is a sheet of just most, some of the partners that we're working with to get all of these projects done. And, and certainly we couldn't do anything on our own. So it's just a tremendous um, partnership and collaboration. So let's talk about projects you might know and recognize. I know um, we just heard about the East Shore Trail. Hopefully everybody has been on it. If you haven't, um, we need to get you guys out there as soon as possible. It, it's truly spectacular. It's uh, what we refer to as the impossible trail because for 40 years, there was a line on a map and everybody said, that's a nice line on a map, but it is impossible. You'll never get it built. But this is what happens when 15 partners come together. Everybody puts funding in. Um, you hire a great contractor, granite construction, um, and NDOT built this beautiful path for us. 
And you might have heard the role of the Tahoe Fund was to raise private funding to help secure the public funding. And just wanted to share with you how we did that. If you haven't been on the trail, there are 16 Vista points all along the path. This is one of the larger ones. And we were able to um, sell these lakes that you can see that um, private donors could put inscriptions on um, from anywhere ranging from $20,000 up to $100,000. This is a $100,000 Vista here. Um, and we did this before we had a trail. We had um, manzanita bushes and shrub, and we had to take people walking along the side of the highway. And we said, picture what this could look like. There's gonna be a beautiful trail. Um, and they all bought into it. They all saw the vision, they all believed it. Um, so we were able to raise um, a, originally a little over $750,000 from Vista Points. We also, we knew that we were going to attract a lot of people on the trail and as beautiful as it is, we also wanted to make sure we're taking advantage of the educational opportunity that we could really build lifelong stewards of the lake. We got a great grant from NV Energy Foundation and we were able to build out 23 different interpretive panels along the whole trail. So not only do you get a great view of Tahoe, uh, but it truly is a learning experience at the same time. And we worked with all of our partners on the content on these. Uh, we also, we didn't just sell Vista Points. Uh, we, we knew that there were people out there and actually the Vista Points sold out in about six weeks um, that really wanted to be part of the trail. Uh, so we also sold fish for a $5,000 donation. You can put your family's name on a trout and it goes along the bridges along the trail. Um, we've now sold over 150 trout um, times 5,000. You can see the numbers are really adding up for the private support. Um, and then we came in at a little slightly lower level. You can get a bear for $2,500. Um, these went in on the path right when it starts. And then last year, we built a blue concrete outline of Tahoe as you come through the tunnel at Hidden Beach. I think there's about 84 bears in there and, and more scheduled to go in. But probably what makes this project such a success is not the folks that could write the big checks, um, but we wanted everybody to be a part of it. So we asked that for, a, we told folks for a $100 donation, your name can go on the donor wall. Um, and this is the original donor wall that's up right now. It has over 700 different families' names on there. Uh, we are in the process of putting up a second donor wall because of course, as soon as we built the trail, everybody said, this is so awesome. How do I get my name on the donor wall? Um, so now we have over 800 names going on a second donor wall a little further down the path, um, which has been great. And what we've been able to do is we, we funded the first 500,000 that we needed for the construction mash to secure a $12.5 million federal grant. Um, and then we put everything else that we raised into a long-term maintenance fund for the first three miles. Um, and then we got to a point where we had a million dollars in the long-term maintenance fund and we're still selling bears and trout and people want their name on a donor wall. Um, and so we decided in June of 2019 that all new donations would go into a general bike trails fund so that we could start to grow funding for the next phase from Sand Harbor down to Spooner. Um, and because of our great success with these donation options, we now have a million dollars in the long-term maintenance fund, a little more than that. And we have about 1.4 million in the general bike trails fund. Um, 36,000 of that has already been committed for expanded parking in Incline, so the Northern Trailhead. Um, that will be used by Tahoe Transportation District to match for lots more public funding. Um, and same thing for new parking in a trail from Chimney Beach, Secret Harbor, and Thunderbird Cove area. $350,000 has been committed of just private funding to help secure all the public funding for those. And just a couple of weeks ago, we worked with the Tahoe Transportation District. We pledged that we will have $2 million as a match for construction for a federal tribal lands grant that would be $60 million. So. We haven't raised all that money yet, but if they are able to secure that grant, we will come up with $2 million, no problem, uh, for that next uh, spectacular trail. Uh, so that's really probably the best example of the power of philanthropy and what the Tahoe Fund can do when we are able to work with our great partners, uh, especially in state of Nevada. Um, and, and moving on, um, I know that you already saw pictures of this, but the Spooter Lake State Park improvements, we just fell in love with this project when state parks came to us a few years ago. We were able to raise a little over $300,000, um, which was great to see the state 
support this project with the bond sales. I mean, that's really where you get private donors involved and excited when you say, hey, if we can raise a few hundred thousand dollars of private funds, that will encourage the state to commit the public funding, the bond funds to make this project happen. And I was out there a couple months ago and they, if you haven't been out there yet, they have made incredible progress. The outdoor amphitheater is nearly complete and the visitor center is even further along than this photo. It's it's under snow right now, so it's probably a little hard to get out there and finish construction, but I know they plan to do it uh, later this spring and we'll look forward to a great grand opening celebration for that. And what we love about this project is Spooner is just this magical place that sees over 100,000 visitors a year, 150,000 visitors a year, but there was never really an infrastructure in place to tell people where to go. So you pulled in and the parking lot was confusing. There was an old bathroom there, and now there'll be this beautiful welcoming visitor center, which will really set the tone for sustainable recreation and stewardship and for how people should appreciate the environment while they're here recreating in it. Um, and as was mentioned, phase three is a new uh, water wildlife viewing platform out onto Spooner Lake. Um, and we are currently in conversations with a potential donor for a $200,000 gift um, to help make that project happen. More exciting things to come for Spooner. Um, and then a smaller project for the Incline Flume Trail. If you haven't been on the Incline Flume Trail, it is the flattest, most family-friendly trail in all of Lake Tahoe. Uh, you access it off Mount Rose Highway, and it's an old flume system, so it's very flat, um, and everyone in the community loved it, but it wasn't technically part of the Forest Service trail system. So the Tahoe Fund supported the efforts of Friends of Incline Trails to do all the environmental work necessary for the Forest Service to approve it um, through NEPA, and Endow came in and gave us a great help with some goshawk studies, um, and we were able to get the the project approved, and then we were successful in getting a rec trails program, an RTP grant through state parks to help do all the work on the trail, about $130,000. Um, it's almost complete. 90% of the project is done. There's one bridge that needs to get done, but uh, Calador fire and COVID has delayed us, but we hope to get that in this summer once the snow melts. Um, and then the Tunnel Creek single track, I don't know if anyone's done the, so that's the incline flume trail. The big flume trail everyone knows about is the Marlette flume trail. Um, and at the end of the flume trail is this sandy, dusty road called Tunnel Creek. Um, and bikers come bombing down the trail and a lot of folks don't make it to the bottom. Well, they make it to the bottom, but usually in an ambulance. It's just really not meant for bike riding. Um, and the other thing we're seeing, as Joanne mentioned, this huge increase in recreation in the basin. People are learning to walk, or not learning. They're, they, it's a beautiful hike. It's not very intense. It's a wide road. It feels very safe. So you have all these people walking up a road while bikes are bombing down it. So we're so excited to partner with State Parks and Great Basin Institute, our friends at Tamba and the Rim Trail to help build a new single track trail. You can see the road, sort of this line through here is the road. The trail is going to go down below it. Um, so we'll be able to separate bikers and hikers from each other. And it'll be a much better experience for everyone. Um, and if you haven't been uh, to Tunnel Creek, let me know. I'm happy to guide a tour. The first mile up, there's a giant rock that somebody carved into the shape of a monkey. Everybody calls it monkey rock. So another great one. Um, and then lastly, a project we're really excited about as we look at, you know, our mission is to use the power of philanthropy to improve the Lake Tahoe environment for all to enjoy. So we really have to ask ourselves, what kind of projects can we do for all to enjoy? The East Shore Trail, universal access. We see people out there all the time in wheelchairs. Um, and it just, it makes you feel so great to know we really are making this for all to enjoy. Well, if you've ever driven across Mount Rose Highway in the Tahoe Meadow up there is a beautiful boardwalk that was put in really to protect the wetlands that people were just trampling across. Um, but if you look at it in the view of somebody that's in a wheelchair, it looks like an amazing way to really experience Tahoe. Uh, the only issue is that to get from the highway to this ramp, there are stairs. There is not, a ramp, or to get to the boardwalk, there's stairs uh, because the intention was really not accessibility, it was um, environmental protection. So we're working with some partners at Truckee Meadows, Parks Foundation, and hopefully with NDOT to try to get a ramp built this summer so that people um, who are disabled are able to easily access this beautiful ramp and get out into the room trail. So much more to come on that. Um, and those are just some of the projects we're working on right now on the Nevada side of the lake. 
Um, and if you if you do want to keep up to date on Tahoe, we almost every Thursday, not every Thursday, but most, we put out something we call our Lake Tahoe Fun Facts. So if you want to just kind of be in the know, uh, you can subscribe to our e-newsletter just on our home page or send me an email, I'll sign you up. Um, and every about every Thursday, you'll learn something uh, interesting, super random. You'll win a trivia contest at dinner with your family. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Ms. Barry. That was a really, really wonderful presentation. Um, enthusiastic. I'm excited about a lot of the programs that you've put in. I have yet to do a walking trail myself, but it's on my on my list now that my kids are a little bit older and can maybe manage to walk most of it themselves now. Um, honestly, it's been hard for our family to make it up there because we have five of us and all our gear to park before we can get down to the lake. And um, parking has been such a hardship that we haven't gone for almost two years now. And so I'm looking forward to, to all the efforts personally <laughs> that are going in to make it easier for us to come up and um, visit the lake more often. It's also funny to me that we're working on access to some of these hidden gems that as a kid you had to know uh which rock to pull off on the highway at <laughs> couldn't find it <laughs> so i'm i'm glad i'm glad for this effort and i'm glad that we're taking it the environmental consequences of more access seriously and we're putting in the kind of stability that we need to make those work for our communities so thank you so much for your effort um, it's really impressive are there any questions barry yes yeah, so somebody woman krasner go ahead Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, and thank you, Ms. Barry, for your presentation. So just two questions. The $100 name on the donor wall, can we still do that or are we too late? No, you can still do it. It'll go on the third donor wall, which has a okay. giant TBD in terms of the date of when it will be installed. But okay, great news for us. <laughs> yeah. And then the next one, um, the Tahoe Meadows Accessibility Ramp, what a wonderful idea for people with disabilities. Is that something that's in the works now, or is that something that you're hoping to get a bill draft request from this committee for? Well, you know, we hadn't even uh, considered a bill draft request. Um, you know, we the Tahoe Fund funded all the planning for last year, um, and now we have a budget about 200, I can't remember if it's 150 or 200 thousand dollars for the construction build. Um, we may need some support with NDOT. They're going to be redoing that highway this summer. Last year they did conduit. This year they're going to redo the highway. If there was any way we could find a way to work with NDOT to maybe build it into that contract or find a way to have some cost savings um, and maybe a public private partnership, NDOT could put some funding in and the Tahoe Fund would raise the rest to make that happen. Thank you. For the question, I think there's some folks on here who could uh, offer that suggestion to end up. Um, that is my fan. I love the Tahoe Basin. It really is like a crux in my life. Um, my husband and I took our engagement photos in that meadows, and I just love that area. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions from the committee? not seeing any so thank you so much miss barry appreciate your presentation and your enthusiasm for this work thank you chair right we're going to move on to our almost last agenda item item 10 this is our last presentation i believe for the day um item 10 is the overview of the marlette lake water system and updates on improvements and priorities and this is always really interesting and complex the system is really unique um, and something that's kind of a gem in nevada although it's um a gem in need of attention uh, i'm gonna go ahead and pass on um, the presentation to ward patrick and his office um, to talk a little bit about where they're at go ahead mr patrick as you will thank you chair under the leadership of Director Laura Freed, I'm Ward Patrick, the Administrator for the State Public Works Division. To answer questions today, we'll also have uh, the Deputy Director Matthew Tuma and Daniel Daniel Marlowe from uh, Administrative Services Division. He's the Administrator. And I'd like to introduce you to uh, one of our newest team members, Dave, David Dutra. He's our Deputy Administrator and uh, overseeing the Marlette Lake Water System. He comes from a background of uh, 
waste reduction and recycling industry. He's got business management system experience. And most recently from the University of Nevada, Reno uh, in facilities maintenance. I'll turn the presentation over to David. Thank you, Ward. Madam Chair, members of the committee, again, my name is David Dutra, Deputy Administrator for Nevada State Buildings and Grounds, which includes the Marlette Lake System. Let's see if we can't get the slideshow rolling. This takes a little bit of time to load. There we are. Okay, so let's uh, start the presentation with just an overview. Um, originally, the dam, the Morlet Lake Dam was constructed in 1873 in support of the logging industry. But later it went uh, uh, into service for the collection, treatment and conveyance of water for domestic and industrial mining uses, primarily in the Comstock area. The state of Nevada acquired the system in 1963. And currently the sole source of water, it is currently the sole source of water for Virginia City, Gold Hill, Silver City, and in addition, Carson City. Carson City is the majority of, uh, consumes the majority of the water that the system uh, generates. So for today's presentation, we're gonna cover the, the historical overview and key features, some of the major components of the facility, uh, the stakeholders, customers and beneficiaries, and also our recent improvements that have been completed and are in use, planned improvements, and those are improvements that are in design and engineering and future improvements. So we'll begin with a history overview of the more significant features of the system. The system was engineered by Herman Schusler in 1873, and later was acquired by the um, Curtis Wright Company in 1933, and the state again purchased the system in June of 1963 for the total sum of $1.65 million. The system is recognized as an engineering feat, and as such, is dedicated uh, was dedicated the historic civil engineering landmark in 1975 by the American Society of Civil Engineers. It's also listed on the National Registry of Historic Places in 1992. Water is collected from various sources within the basins and total as much as 2.63 billion gallons of water annually. Water is collected and then sold to nearby Story County and Carson City. The table here indicates uh, eight years of water sales between our customers in acre feet. And on a combined basis, uh, accounts for over 550 million gallons of water. A sig significant key uh, feature was introduced in 1966 with the collapse of the tunnel, and I, I'll, I'll share more about that in just a few minutes. Um, after the, the tunnel collapsed, uh, a, a, a generator, a diesel-fired generator was put in place in order to power a pump system, which allowed the water um, system to pump water over the uh, over the hill uh, the the basin and, and into the Hobart basin so um, prior to pumping the system it relied on a robust flume system constructed of redwood this flume system extended for eight and a half miles um, and on a uh, uh, well, so, so what would happen is water would drain out of the Marlette Lake through the flume system and around to the incline portal or west portal or tunnel system. And uh, I believe um, it was discussed just, just previously, Amy Berry was talking about the trail systems that utilize this old flume uh, uh, system here that's long since been abandoned. The incline tunnel or the Westport, uh, as it's sometimes called, 
was nearly 4,000 feet long, connect, with connections made from both sides in 1877, it allowed water to flow from Merlot, Marlette Lake to reach the Comstock in 1877, which, um, however, in, uh, the system collapsed, the tunnel system collapsed in 1957, and the system now relies on pumping, which I discussed earlier. The system is a collective combination of major components. Some of the more significant components include the Marlette Lake itself, Marlette pump and generator uh, facility, which we will show, the Hobart Reservoir and the diversion dam, as well as the inverted siphon, which is a pumping or uh, a piping system from the Lakeview tank to east across uh, Washoe, Washoe Valley uh, to support uh, Virginia City. Both Story County, Virginia City, and Carson City have a significant investment in facilities that include water distribution, storage, and treatment. This map is of the East Slope, which is primarily under uh, the state's management. It includes Marlette Lake, shown here, the pumping station, it routes water up and over the ridge into the Hobart Reservoir. Water then flows out of the reservoir and around to the east side. But in addition to that, we also have a number of collection basins shown here. Those collection basins collect water from small tributaries that are receiving water from snow melt-off. Those flow into the diversion dam along with the Hobart Reservoir spill. At that point, it's metered and flows around again further to the east to the Lakeview tank, where it's then divided between Carson City and uh, Virginia City. Each of the components uh, is considered a vital uh, aspect or part of the operation, but really none more as important as the Marlette Lake generator building. This one really stands out it's a converted 12-cylinder diesel motor. Uh, it converted to natural gas, shown here, and it supports uh, or powers the pump. This particular project uh, was a $7.5 million project completed in 2009. Prior to that, we relied on that, that smaller diesel motor that it was shown. Uh, water is pumped from the Marlette Lake to the Hobart Reservoir where it can add up to 35 million gallons of storage capacity. All of that's made possible by a rubble earthen fill dam supporting uh, the reservoir. I mentioned catchments that are located on the East Basin and this particular slide, slide excuse me, uh, shows the catchment. This, uh, these catchments, which number six today, can add up to as much as 200 gallons per minute to the system. And again, they catch runoff. Uh, they're small seasonal tributaries uh, supported by the snow melt and, and uh, uh, small um, streams and, uh, let's see, um, well, I, I, uh, I can't think of the name, but uh, anyway, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so the, uh, the catchments, again, are an important aspect of, of the system. Shown here in the upper right-hand corner is one of the older catchments. Those were later rebuilt or replaced in 2014 with the newer catchments. This is a blow-off lid catchment in case water overwhelms the system. It allows water to come out of the top. And you can see um, there is a debris uh, uh, netting uh, reinforced steel in front of those catchments to catch large, larger debris. However, in 2017, the system was really overwhelmed with heavy snow melt and runoff, uh, blowing the top off of the system and uh, requiring a great deal of, of, of restoration. Uh, we actually went in and rebuilt the top of it, adding two feet to it. And you can see the catchment here 
which allows water to slow, settle. It allows uh, uh, suspended solids to settle out before um, um, continuing on. And this improves the clarity of the water by the time it's, it's uh, to our customers. I mentioned the catchments and uh, the Hobart streams. Those come together here at this point. This is called the diversion dam. This is also a metered, uh, a point of metering where we can meter the catchment runoff as well as uh, the outflow of Hobart Dam before it uh, uh, flows continue on to the Lakeview tank. The Lakeview tank is the last point in the system where water is allowed to stand and solids to settle out before they're diverted onto the customers. What you're looking at here is a 22,000 gallon tank along with the fueling uh, structure and the control stations that uh, meter the water through the inverted siphon line as well as the line to Carson City. This is an illustration of the line coming off from the tank down into the Carson City Basin. Uh, it requires the use of three air boxes, and that's to uh, uh, reduce the amount of pressure that water builds as it, as it falls. It lands in uh, the state-owned one million gallon reservoir, which Carson City utilizes, as well as other standing tanks for the management of the water before going on to their water treatment facility. These air boxes that are used in that run uh, were also replaced, rebuilt and replaced. You can see one here was uh, damaged and weeping and leaking uh, and not as efficient as it ought to have been. So those systems were replaced. Next and to our east, extending across Washoe Valley is Story County's east slope side that, that uh, includes much of their systems. At the time constructed, the inverted siphon was the largest inverted pipe siphon system in the world. It was designed for 800 PSI and is currently accepting about 700 PSI of pressure. At the end of the siphon shown here, that pressure is reduced as it climbs up out of the basin. It's reduced to about 30 pounds of pressure, which flows naturally over to the reservoir and onto the Virginia City side. For, for treatment. In addition to the water customers, there are, of course, other beneficiaries and stakeholders in the system. First, the water customers, uh, there are two at this point. We have Carson City, which uh, supports about 20,000 customers and Story County supporting uh, just over 700 customers. On a combined basis, again, they require about 550 million gallons of water annually. This is a list of some, some of the benefactors uh, that uh, frequent the area, but it is quite sufficient. Uh, we're quite proud of managing the, the assets with so much to offer beyond just water. Uh, again, as, as Amy Berry pointed out, uh, there's a trail system there that, that's utilized. Uh, some estimate that as much as 2 million visitors uh, frequent the area. And here's quite an extensive list of those benefactors benefactors. One in particular is the State Department of Wildlife. Uh, they have constructed a number of uh, fish, fishing catching systems, which allow them to catch eggs and plant those eggs in other waterways throughout the state. There's also a, a guzzler there for wildlife uh, on the east slope. So the the, again, the benefits extend well beyond just the water that uh, that's captured. But uh, those recent improvements uh, obviously make it possible for us to continue to run a 148-year-old system. Again, we talked about some of the catchments. But uh, as you can see from this list, um, there were a number of projects in recent years completed. Uh, the uh, replacement of the generator and the old pump control systems was a CIP project completed in 2021. Most recently, uh, Ward and I had an opportunity to tour um, 
Virginia City's water treatment facilities and uh, took note of their two new tanks that are seen here on the hillside. That adds about a million gallons of additional storage for, for their service accounts. In addition to the state sponsored projects, Story County's rehabilitation of their reservoir is shown here. That's a uh, welded seam, I believe 80 mil polyurethane lined uh, reservoir that is also used for fire suppression, the storage of water for, for fire suppression as well as consumption. Um, we also have a picture of their treatment facility in the lower right hand corner in the middle is the SCADA system. That allows all of the jurisdictions benefiting through this system to look at what the flow rates are and manage their systems more effectively. But we're not finished. We have a number of planned improvements. Planned improvements are those improvements that are currently uh, in design. And most significant is the Marlette Lake Dam Restoration Project, now 60% complete. The um, illustration below is a, uh, a cross section of the dam showing a, uh, a buttress fill area, as well as a new control station and a number of other projects that are uh, tied in with this particular one, including um, uh, road maintenance, trail restoration, and, and control points uh, on the dam. Uh, we're, we're spending time to complete a master plan study. The study will include water demands, um, the uh, system on, on as a whole, and what the system can support. Uh, we've got the Hobart Dam Rehabilitation Project. That is in design now and 35% complete. And that's a, a seismic, seismic retrofit to the dam uh, and, and restoring that uh, infrastructure, as well as the diversion dam, which I showed a picture of earlier. Uh, that too is going to be uh, modernized and brought to standard. We'd also like to add some additional catchments and the design of those is 35% underway. Future projects are projects that are planned but not yet funded. And those are anything really from analytical and economic studies to infrastructure projects. The infrastructure or capital projects may include projects such as the East Slope transmission main upgrade or the uh, sawmill transmission upgrade. So that's a three and a half mile pipeline replacement, 18 inches currently to 24 inches at a cost of $15.8 million. The uh, Lakeview to I-580 transmission line, this is about an $8.6 million project and that's to replace the original inverted line currently in use and installed in 1877. So I think we got the useful life out of that line. Um, the uh, Lakeview to Carson City transmission line is also proposed and that's about $5.3 million. All combined, the list before you adds up to about $40 million of uh, capital. Operationally, the system requires fiscal attention as well. The Marlette Lake Dam level recovery after the dam rehabilitation uh, is a matter of concern. This dam reconstruction will take water levels down as much as 10 to 12 feet and um, prohibit the pumping of water to the Hobart Reservoir. Uh, that um, will, will obviously restrict flows to Carson City and uh, Virginia City, which will have an impact on our operating revenue. Rebuilding the generator is of interest and, and most important, that's at its end of its useful life. Again, that large 12 cylinder motor uh, operates on a continual basis uh, during peak seasonal um, seasons. And uh, so it, it, uh, it doesn't take long before those motors are end of life. And uh, we need to raise the uh, inlet um, 
for the pump off the bottom of the lake. This will improve clarity and efficiencies. We also want to replace some of the operating equipment, which has reached end of its life, um, and construct a uh, equipment shed. And this will help preserve the equipment that we have, especially during the snow season. We'd also like to upgrade the control and data acquisition system, or SCADA, which is used for uh, controlling um, the metering valves and operating the system. So with that, the Marlette Lake water system is recognized historically. Uh, it is a system of uh, great engineering. It is a challenging system given its location. Uh, it's about 1,700 feet above Lake Tahoe and I think sits just around about 9,000 foot elevation. So access to these uh, systems and the infrastructure is difficult during winter, winter months. It's, it's a challenge, uh, but it's one that we all uh, love. Uh, we take great pride in the system. And uh, I have to say personally, uh, I am thrilled to have the opportunity to take part in the management of that system. And with that, I'm happy to turn it over to, uh, to back to the committee for questions and answers. Thank you so much. Are there any questions from the committee? I have one um, related to redundancies. As we heard last interim, um, there were not many on the system. And when it went down, we depended on the stored water. And I'm just wondering if there are proposed uh, designs or plans to address the redundancy issue, particularly for pumps, or if you were able to address that in this last um, biennium. Ward Patrick, for the record, thanks for the question. Yeah, this is, a, a, you know, as we mentioned, it's a very old system and, and it was originally designed without that redundancy. We've been dis discussing redundancy, but uh, there's been no real work to, to improve any redundancy. You'll note that uh, there's so many needs that are just, just to keep uh, one leg open in all directions. And so as that gets completed, it's likely that we can keep some of the uh, existing piping open which would create some uh, redundancy, although it would be age redundancy, not state-of-the-art redundancy. This is a really unique system. If you haven't seen um, parts and pieces of it, I would encourage you to try and get out and see this system. Um, it is truly an engineering feat and amazing that it's still up and running, especially with some of the Parts and pieces being over 100 years old, almost, uh, what are we, 150 years old, I guess, at this point. Are there any other questions from the committee? In this? I don't see any. There may come some more as we keep talking about the needs of, um, of your program, but um, I would also encourage the committee to feel free to reach out to Mr. Patrick and Mr. Dutra, um, if you have any questions related to the system, it's been kind of a contentious issue in the legislature, but I think um, they're in a pretty good place. Oh, I guess I do have one more question. Last, last interim, we were talking about the potential of some sales of water to the Tumwa system. Do you have an update on those discussions? Or Patrick, we do, thank you. Yes. Uh, the Turkey Meadows Water Authority is still very interested in, in becoming a customer and they're looking and we're looking into uh, ways to trial uh, pushing water through the Federal Water Master through Lake Tahoe through the natural natural means and uh, so they're still very interested we're uh, we we're very hopeful when we had the big snow in December like oh boy there's going to be an excess of water and I would say that the uh, uh, Tumwa has been working with uh, Carson City and Story County to make sure that uh, uh, it's, it's understood and everybody agrees that Tumwa would take water that is not necessarily needed by the two primary customers, current primary customers right now. And so it appears to be a very, uh, working toward a very symbiotic relationship where when water, water, when there's less water, the existing customers will be getting water and when there's an excess of water, uh, the, the Reno area and the Turkey Meadows Water Authority could utilize that 
compensate the state. Thus, it would end up helping uh, preserve and uh, maintain the system. So it's it's uh, all systems go, although that hasn't been uh, put into effect or tried and true, but we're uh, they're still interested and so is the state is my best information, thanks. Great, I uh, appreciate you guys keeping us updated on that. Um, do you, can you remind me, do you as a state um, managing the system, set the rates for the users or are those set by the treatment um, and then the cost from the treatment systems passed on to the users? Yes, thank you for asking that. Uh, we went to IFC to get uh, authority to use operating funding for a the master plan, which was discussed here in, in brief. And uh, due to uh, Due to the current fiscal situations where we have a very low uh, reserve, we put that on hold. And so we'd appreciate the committee's support in uh, in an item that's been sent to through to the governor's finance office. And we believe it will make it to the April uh, interim finance committee. And the intent there would be to complete the master plan. It would enable rate studies, and a simple rate study to be done. And uh, statute allows and requires the state to set the rates. And so the process that we've outlined for Marlette Lake is to uh, work on the master plan and therefore then develop rates based on the master planning process. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead. Uh, just to add on to that. So uh, like uh, Matthew Tuma for the record, uh, like Administrator Patrick said, we set the rates of what we charge Karsten City and Story County at a whole, but they set the individual water rates for their customers. So we do not set those rates. Thank you so much. Um, I have a history of being on that system. I think I shared that last interim. I, I grew up in a house in Silver City and I remember it was one of my first experiences with a different water system seeing that tank on the hillside um, and talking about where the water came from. And I remember thinking like, how the heck do they get water across Washoe Valley? <laughs> so, well, I, are there any other questions from the committee on this particular topic area? I'm not seeing any, so I will let you guys go. Thank you so much for the presentation and the update. Uh, on those a couple of issue areas um, and we look forward to hearing from um, things we can do to help out if there's anything that comes up in the interim. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Great. That is uh, the end of our uh, presentations for today. We're gonna move on to agenda item 11, which is public comment. Um, this is our second public comment and I'm going to um, call for a short three-ish minute break to allow people to call in because we know there's a little bit of a delay. If you're listening online or would like to provide public comment, please go ahead and call 669-900-6833 um, and then enter that meeting ID on the agenda, which I don't have in front of me so I can't read it off to you. I apologize for that. Um, we'll go ahead and take a three minute break here.
right, folks, we're going to go ahead and come back to order for a public comment. Thank you, Chair. To provide public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. I want to remind the public as they call in to please clearly state and spell your name and we are limiting comments to three minutes to ensure everyone is given a fair opportunity to speak. You are more than welcome to follow up your comments with written comments that we will review later, um, after this meeting. Good afternoon, Chair. Um, sorry, I missed the beginning of the session. So is this um, Chair Sarah Peterson? Yes, Sarah, Sarah Peters. Oh, Sarah Peterson. Thank you so much. I'm, my name is Dora Martinez, and I'm totally blind, so I'm trying to um, pin your voice to your name. Very lovely voice. Um, I represent the Disability Peer Action Coalition, and I just want to say thank you so much for um, Amy Berry's um, presentation. I, we are applauding here with a bunch of our, my disabled friends who are wheelchair users and walkers, uh, who uses the walker. Um, hopefully we'll get that ramp, ramp um, going. And thank you so much, um, um, Assemblywoman Lisa Krasner for recognizing that. And hopefully if they don't get a, um, funding for that, BDR will be appropriate. Last year, we really wanted to go to Lake Tahoe. Uh, we've been so cooked up in our, um, our homes but we couldn't make it up there um, due to um, inadequate RTC services. We were not able to go to the Summit Mall and, and get the RTC bus to go up to the lake. So hopefully this year they will uh, provide RTC at the Meadowood Mall so people with disability can also be included and use that um, beautiful Lake Tahoe scenery that you all talk about. I appreciate all your time and thank you so much, Chair. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Always lovely to hear from you. Is there another caller on the line for public comment? Chair, the public line is open and working, but we have no further callers at this time. Uh, at this point, I will close agenda item 11 for public comment and are there any comments from members of the committee before we adjourn? Just want to thank you all for your time today. It's a pleasure being here with you. I'm looking forward to being able to meet in person and visit the lake if we can, hopefully in the summer month. Um, I want to just note that our next meeting is Friday, May 27th, and we will let you know um, in the coming months whether that meeting is expected to be virtual or in person and where we may have it if it's in person. That concludes business for today. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much.